disease, and there are a lot of medications that we have for that. In the moderate stages of the disease, people get behavioral problems where they'll be like asleep during the day and up all night. That's something that caregivers have a really right. hard time with because that means they're up all night, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it just doesn't, doesn't work here. So there are things we can do for sleep sometimes or, or restlessness or agitation. Sometimes patients get psychotic, they get you know delusional, they think someone's stealing their things where you know, really they just misplaced it or forgot where they put it or something mm -hmm. and they kind of make up these stories and sometimes they get out of hand. And so there are a lot of treatments for the symptoms of the disease. And there are other medical conditions that can mimic Alzheimer's and you never want someone to go in a nursing home when they have a vitamin deficiency, you know, just call it Alzheimer's. So. So do you feel optimistic? I mean, I know neurology is a frustrating specialty. Well, it used to be frustrating. Oh, well, it's wonderful to speak to you because I sense this tremendous optimism from you. You seem to really feel very positive about this disease and perhaps about what can be done for, for brain dysfunction I in think, general. I think in neurology in general, mm -hmm. we, we are at a point where our understanding is so much greater than you know, I graduated medical school in 1983, and I, you know, residency several years later, and I, I was involved in Alzheimer's because of my interest in it, as far as characterizing it in the early research. But you know, back then you really couldn't do anything. We were looking at the first clinical trials of a medicine. You had to give it four times a day. Could you imagine giving an Alzheimer's patient a medicine four? I couldn't remember to take a medicine four times, much less someone with Alzheimer's. <laughs> It's an interesting it's double bind the there. Liver, you know. yeah. But, you know, we were just starting the first clinical trials, and there really wasn't anything you could give for mm -hmm. the symptoms. You just made sure that, you know, the thyroid was all right, and you kind of called the nursing home. But now there are. There are a lot of things. And when, it, when a new patient comes into me now, I say, you know, these medicines that we have now are going to hopefully just hold things where they are or improve a little until the vaccine or these really better things come along, at least in, in clinical trials. And you have a lot of avenues. You have the established treatments, the medicines that help the memory, the problems with attention, the behaviors. Or you can do the clinical trials to look at things like the vaccines that are coming. Mm -hmm. And in a few years, we're going to have the vaccines. I think a lot of areas in neurology are like that. We're really understanding the biology of them mm -hmm. now. And the treatments are very rational based on what causes the disease. Oh, that's wonderful so it is, news. It's really exciting. Yeah, I feel very right good specialty. speaking to you. <laughs> um, well, your area is the human brain, and obviously you know it well, or as well as anyone. Right. Um, what surprises you about it? Maybe ha how people think or the variability. There are no two patients that are the same. There are no two problems that are the same. Hmm. They're different issues. It's infinitely um, complex. It always keeps you thinking. And I think, you know, I think if someone is a hematologist, you know, all their patients come in with fatigue. <laughs> they draw 12 tubes of blood. They put it in the computer, and they see what pops out as a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in neurology and in, in with the brain, it, I mean, we have billions of brain cells, billions, and each one has, like, hundreds or thousands of connections with other cells and it it's a miracle that that it gets wired correctly and anyone can think to even start so it amazes with. you it, it is it is amazing. have you always been drawn to complexity puzzles yeah puzzles yeah. so you're yeah. a pu I you're, like puzzles yeah and you yeah. see the brain as this massive pu puzzle <laughs> yes yeah in uh -huh. a way in a way it is and you're working on it's little like areas challenge. And, yeah challenge how like interesting challenge of it. Now, have you had, as a scientist, any eureka moments, moments where something snapped for you and you saw it clearly or you solved something puzzle-like? I think it's once in a while looking under the microscope and seeing something and thinking, like making a jump, you know, that could lead to an intervention. I, you know, it's yeah. happened every, you know, five years or something, you'll see something and maybe it's something no one ever noticed before, or maybe it was something no one bothered paying any attention to, and all of a sudden you say, oh, you know, that could be important. That's a strategy. You know, that, mm. that's something to, you know, and then I'll work on that for a few, for a few years and try to, um, try to uh, make it work. 
Now, how much time do you spend in the lab and how much time doing other sorts of things? Because you're also sort of the face of the it's laboratory. Pretty, it's pr yeah, it's pretty, um, you're the director pretty evenly the divide, pretty evenly divided. I do um, about a, a third of the time in the lab, maybe about a third of the time actually, you know, seeing patients and mm -hmm. involved with, you know, clinical trials, just, you know, directly kind of assessing patients for one thing or another. And then a third, I do a lot of kind of educational things where I teach residents, medical students, general mm -hmm. public, you know, anyone or administrative stuff or other things. My time's really pretty evenly divided between between clinical care and in the work I do in the lab. And some of it kind of mixes. If you're looking at a clinical trial, mm -hmm. is that research or is that clinical? You're dealing with a patient, so it's clinical, but you're dealing with something experimental, so it's, it's research. And but you're dealing with different sorts of personalities. I mean, working in the lab with other researchers mm -hmm. is yep. a certain sort of, and then yep. working with families with this devastating yep. disease, it must be such a different sort of emotional experience for you. Do you find you have to turn parts of yourself on and off? or I like the diversity of it. Yeah, yeah. I like mm. to, to switch, wear different hats, switch things around a little bit. Yeah. But I'm lucky. I have, I have wonderful people working with our department. We have a wonderful chair, and I have all the people kind of working under me in the lab and in the clinic, our nurses, our, our, our scientists, and our clinicians. They're, they're really, um, they're very, very dedicated and people who are excellent at what they do. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of makes it a pleasure to, you know, I can kind of move from one thing to another with some peace of mind, you know, knowing that chaos won't ensue when I walk out a door. <laughs> yeah. And that's important. And, um, you know, they make it a pleasure too, because I'm trying to kind of, kind of mentor them, you know, pop them up a level at the same time. So. Right, right. Yes, you are mentoring people in, in right, the lab right. it, it, who are graduate students, I take it, as well as postdocs and so forth. Yeah, people, we um, have people, you know, all the way from, you know, medical students. We have a lot of residents in, mm -hmm. the, in the lab that work. There's, we have a PhD now, and um, they're just all sorts of people in and out all the time. Now, as a woman scientist in this field, I, I think that you're relatively rare in this particular area? Maybe not. I'm wondering how you feel. I mean, you're, you're dealing with families often. Right. Um, women are often caregivers, not always, right. but often they in are. these cases. Yeah. Do you find that it gives you a, a special leverage or a particular positioning with respect to both the families and maybe in investment in the research? Or am I uh, projecting too much here? I think women's Maybe sometimes caregivers would link to me sometimes, and I can relate to them yeah. more easily. Some of these caregivers, they're unbelievable women. They, not only are they taking care of this person who like needs complete care for all activities of daily living 24-7, but they're also like getting a master's degree somewhere, <laughs> or you know, holding up jobs. Yeah. And I, How do you do it all? You know, I just can't. It, I, I think I kind of get some appreciation actually from them when I look at what some of them are and doing. And it's often well. women. You 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 said. I mean, I'm sure there are men too. I think a lot of time, a lot of times it is women. They're a little more likely to be caregivers, uh -huh. and they're they're more maybe a little more used to kind of kicking in and doing it. I'll tell you, some spouses are are very very some you know male spouses are yeah. very dedicated too, and they they just take care of the person to the end. So. I've always wondered about, um, and you sort of address this, but uh, Alzheimer's, if you, if you are in an early stage of this disease, mm -hmm. this must be a particularly devastating time when um, you, especially if you've had a parent or you know someone who's gone through the entire course right. of the illness, um, being able to function but seeing what lies ahead, even though there might be some palliative treatment. Now, do you see people like that who are in a panic-stricken state about what they have to face? And how do you, what do you say to them? Um, the majority of Alzheimer's patients don't have insight into the extent of it. And some don't have insight into it at all. Mm -hmm. So, or their more caregivers often might, it's, yeah. it's more traumatic for their caregivers than it is for them. Those who have a strong family history where it really runs genetic in the family yeah. can pick it up very, very early. The woman I said mentioned yeah. in her 30s and so forth, she came in, and she, 38 years old. I, my mother had this. I'm just like her. I'm getting the same thing. And 
we couldn't pick it up on anything. She's still you smart, you know. Yeah. But but she knew it, it, you know, and it became evident over time. And how long did it take to show it, though? In a year or so. Uh huh. But she it, it's just it. that she was so smart, you know. Yeah. She just dropped. She she noticed that little first drop, uh -huh. you know, and her IQ was still way way high. Um, but it it can be uh, it can be really tough on those with insight, and it it's hard. I mean, they want to get advanced directives. They want to get their things in order. Um, but it is, it's, it's heartbreaking in those that have insight. Are, are there um, dietary uh, suggestions that you, you would make about this illness, uh, what one should There's eat? a lot you can do. There's a lot of epidemiology data and, and, and things that, you know, associate lifestyle and, and diet, exercise, health. Basically, anything that's good for the heart is good for the brain, and it's good for Alzheimer's, good... Uh, control of your, your blood glucose, your blood sugar, mm -hmm. um, exercising, a healthy, kind of a heart healthy diet is an Alzheimer's healthy diet. I have a uh, MPH uh, on our faculty who's interested in looking at caffeine as a protective effect um, because there's some, some literature showing that it, um, it impacts some processes in the brain long term. Um, mm -hmm. But there are um, there are a lot of factors we don't know about. There's certainly a lot of environmental factors that are still elusive. But basically, exercise, health, keeping your mind active. And the good mm -hmm. thing is it can be active with anything you want. You don't have to do a certain, you don't have to do calculus or arithmetic, algebra or anything. You can do anything, even things that involve you know, social interactions, as long as you're making arrangements or dealing with situations or something that that keeps you challenged mentally, all of that seems to, it's almost like the brain is a muscle in that use it or lose it. If you, you keep your brain active and thinking, it, it's stronger and more robust. And if you keep your body active, it has positive influences on things that get into the brain and, and keep it healthy too. Well, thank you very much for a very informative interview, well, thank Carol. Thank you for Lippa. inviting me. I enjoy it. I, I want to see this disease defeated. I think it will be. Um, before you know it, and uh, I enjoy the opportunity to uh, share information about it. Well, thank you, Carol Lippa, and thank you for joining us today on the Drexel Interview.